So let's get started talking about the topic that everybody's interested in, which is how to start a new firm. Um, two people are going to be talking today, my friend Craig Bayer, so I'll let Craig tell you a little bit about him and what he does, and then I'll tell you a bit about me, and then we'll get started. Yeah, so I have been a legal technology consultant for, I guess, a, a long time now. It's the, the only thing that I've ever done. I started off as a uh, person who wanted to be a lawyer and got a, a degree in history and political science, and I, I made the mistake of working at a law firm before I went to law school and really decided it wasn't for me, but I got into legal software and installing and setting up the law firms, and I've been doing that ever since. Just helping firms with practice management, document management, software, billing and accounting, things like that. And I am Ernie Svensson. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Craig and I are good friends. We've done a lot of programs together um, because I'm an attorney who started trying to figure out how to embrace technology, how to leverage it and make use of it in my first big firm practice and then later solo practice. And I found out that it's nice to try to figure things out on your own if you have time and you're interested, but it's better to find people like Craig who know this stuff really well and ask them a lot of questions and then they can help you learn this stuff much better and much faster. So Craig is somebody I relied on when I was trying to figure out how to become paperless and how to be more efficient with technology. So we got to be friends way back when and we've continued to stay friends and we uh, do a lot of these talks together. So today's talk is going to be about creating a new law firm, which is something that lawyers do from time to time. And it's, of course, a very stressful but also very exciting time in a lawyer's life when they start a new practice and uh, break free from either their old practice or start out fresh out of law school. And if you're starting a new law firm, then you know the main thing you want to do is create something that's really smooth, something that's efficient, something that's e easy to operate, um, that's lucrative, uh, because if you can't um, sustain your practice, that's not going to be good. So it's not as much about the technology as it is about creating a practice that is smooth. And I went through this process when I left the big firm where I was for 20 years and went out as a solo. And um, you know, there are there's some key questions that have to be asked and things that have to be addressed. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking really about creating a modern law firm because you know what the kind of law firm you would create today is going to be different than the kind of law firm one would create if they were starting out, say, 20 years ago. So the big overview is you know how do we create a new law firm that's modern, which means you know uh, smooth, efficient, streamlined, and so forth. And so the process of creating a new law firm, modern law firm, starts with developing the right mindset. Um, you don't want to just copy over everything you've learned or seen done in the prior law firm, you want to think about doing things in a new way and that's because technology is always evolving and there's always new options and new things that you can be doing and so you want to pay attention to that and you also want to think about well as you're getting ready to go live so to speak and make the announcement and become official you know what are the things that you have to start working on right away so that that can happen smoothly and you can make a good transition into the new practice. And then of course there's the day you officially start and what things do you need to have in place on the day you start your practice. So that's, those are the three subtopics, the main subtopics that we're going to be talking about as we uh, unpack all of this information about how you start your new law firm. So let's start with the mindset and approach. Okay, so the first thing is you want to have a modern law firm, but what does that look like? How does it operate? And how does that make you more efficient? That's really the key question. And the answer is, um, you know, you, you probably want to be information skilled and so forth, but we're going to talk about that in a second. The, the other thing about the mindset and approach is you want to focus on the fact that you're starting fresh and you don't want to be carrying over those old habits we, that we talked about. And you want to create a bold new approach. And one of the ways to create a bold new approach is to focus on something called the 80-20 rule. This is something that uh, Craig and I have talked about, and I think it's something that can really help your practice. So that's kind of, those are the subtopics in the mindset and approach uh, discussion. So modern law firm is what? A modern law firm is one that is information savvy, meaning that the people that work there are able to find information quickly, easily, 
reliably. Um, that's really key in, um, in the modern practice. Another aspect of this is law f that lawyers in a modern law firm should be skilled at digital discovery because increasingly that's something that matters, you know, figuring out how to find um, information in emails and how do you manage emails and discovery. And every day discovery involves more digital information. So, you know, you, it's not just about managing the information you have, but it's also about managing information that comes up in cases that you're working on if you're a litigator and so forth. And the last part of this is being able to find information quickly and reliably even when you're not in the office, which I know is something that you, Craig, help a lot of folks with when they're setting up their practice, right? Absolutely. And so really you have to start off thinking, um, you know, traditionally, like you said, 20 years ago, brick and mortar practice and you went to work and you worked in there. Now, even if you have an office or you work out of your home, it doesn't really matter. You have to be mobile and you're going to really be expected and you'll want to be able to work from different places. So one of the first things I tell people when they're, when they're going off of their own practices, especially if they're an attorney, you know, you need to have a laptop. Like don't buy a desktop and a laptop. You know, you probably don't have a lot of money to start off with. Buy a laptop. And then when you start thinking about what software and applications you're going to use, you want to make sure that that stuff is able to be accessed on your laptop or on your mobile device. Um, so that's like on oh, a checklist of, you know, what am I going to use in my practice? Am I going to be able to work anywhere? Um, what you want to talk about, and maybe this is the good mindset that you're talking about, is, you know, you don't want to be tethered to a server at an office that you have to go in and do stuff. That's just not the way people want to work anymore. So you need to be completely mobile in pretty much everything that you do. Right. So, yeah, so you want to be information savvy. You want to be location independent, which means mobile. You want to automate or figure out how to outsource things that you need to work on with other people. And, you know, you want to ha think about how your practice is going to be online, you know, with client portals and with marketing online and so forth. And so, you know, Craig's absolutely right. You don't want to just uh, copy over what you've seen before. You want to think about doing things in new ways. And, and so one of the things I see a lot with lawyers that I help to do this, uh, to start their new practice, um, is the idea of letting go of things that used to work or that have become expensive or are relatively expensive given um, the advance of technology and maybe you can do things in a new way. So you want to, you know, avoid dying platforms is one topic, I guess, and, and there's probably a lot to say about this, but I don't know about you, Craig, but when I think of dying platforms, not that WordPerfect is a dying platform, but it, it's got sort of the hallmark of a dying platform in that it's not dominant anymore and so it doesn't connect to as many things, right? Well, yeah, I mean, Word Perfect is probably the perfect example, and I know there's still a lot of people that like it, and there's nothing, in a sense, traditionally wrong with Word Perfect, except that if you're going to ever hire anyone to work for you, um, most likely they have not worked with Word Perfect. I mean, there, there is a subset of people that have, but most of the new hires have never used Word Perfect at all. So that is always an issue. So when you're, you're choosing your technology, you want to at least have something that you know someone is going to have some familiarity with and and the other issue and this is uh, kind of again I hate to completely knock word perfect on this but um, you want to look at some sort of technology that has adapted you know to the cloud so you have some so it doesn't have to be completely cloud based but you have some sort of mobile option and you don't really have those mobile options um, with Word Perfect, like you know, you can't run Word Perfect on an iPhone. You can run Word on an iPhone. You know, right. those are the kind of things that we're looking for. So really, I guess it comes down to um, make a list of the devices that you think you're going to use, and is the stuff that you're thinking about buying going to work on those devices? And it, it's, it's hard to justify Word Perfect in that end. It don't. It only works. It's on a Windows computer, and it doesn't really work on a lot of smart devices. And look, we know there's workarounds. You know, there's workarounds and all this stuff, but they're not super easy. There is some friction there when you have to move to something like that. Right. And, and you know, you help people, lawyers, when they're transitioning, for example, from one platform to another, like let's say WordPerfect to Word, and they'll say, oh, but how do I convert all those files over? You know, and it's like there's a way to do that. You can bulk manage it. Um, it's something you don't want to do yourself, but 
there are ways to migrate away from dying platforms. It's it's not you know something that's uh, super difficult or super expensive to do. So that's one thing is letting go of things that um, they used to do. Um, you know, the other examples would be servers and traditional office space. Craig mentioned moving to the cloud. Uh, but let's talk about spending money. So one thing that I see a lot of lawyers doing when they're starting a new firm is saying, well, I don't want to spend any money, which I totally understand because I had that same mindset. But what happens is they sort of fall into a trap because they they have a blanket mindset against spending money on anything that they never spent money on before. So you had mentioned earlier, Craig, about new computers and mobile devices and you know getting internet um, on mobile is another thing that they should focus on is like not just having internet at their office but also making sure they have high speed internet when they're out and about and a modern website. So you need to spend money on those things even if you've perhaps never spent money on them before or maybe you think you know well I already spent money on the computer but um, the computer is too old. So that's a, that's one issue as well. And then you know the, the this is really the big one uh, is you're doing something significant. So if you have any questions, I would say go get help from people that can help you. There's a lot of resources out there that are free. There's some podcasts you can listen to and so forth. But really, at the end of the day, you know, you kind of want somebody to check over what you're doing or what you're planning to do. And I would say that's where you should try to find a consultant, you know, somebody like Craig who focuses on law firms and who has what I call a fiduciary mindset meaning that they're more interested in helping you than they are in helping themselves. I mean, they obviously make money helping people, but they're, they're not afraid to recommend something even if it's not something that they make money off of or if it's something that they would lose a sale on. And those kind of folks are hard to find, but I can tell you that Craig is one of those people. Um, so that's, that's something um, to keep in mind as well. Well, thank you very much. There's a, a couple of things I just want to add to that. Um, Again, you know, when you're starting a, a new firm, you don't have a limited amount of money, and, and there, that is a little worrisome. If you're going to have to borrow money, um, and you know, there are certain things that you need, I'm just going to tell you a trend that's happening right now that works. It's it's a thing called you know bring your own device. So if you're starting a new firm and you already have a laptop computer that you use for personal use, that could possibly be your work computer, and you could take that money that you were going to spend. For something else, and as as maybe crazy as this sounds, if you're going to hire a paralegal or an associate, and they have their own computer as well, they could use that personal computer. And there's there's ways of talking about how to make sure that you still own the data. But that is a trend that's really helping people start practices out without having to, you know, all right, I got to buy, you know, that was the old thing. I've got to buy five desktop computers, and that was going to cost you, you know you know, five, six thousand dollars. You don't have to do that starting out anymore. Um, and, and the other thing I'd say is when you're looking for um, some advice, there are good uh, technology consultants around the country. You just want someone that has that experience with legal. And really what it'll come into is um, the way that you bill or create settlement statements or deal with insurance companies. These are things that uh, lawyers have to deal with that other industries don't really have to, and and that's the the kind of nitty gritty that I really think someone that you know we say a law focused consultant, it's someone that understands kind of the cash flow of a law firm and and how they're going to make money and can help drive whatever decisions and technology to making sure that's the most efficient. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's turn now to something that really is at the heart of technology, which is leveraging the power of computers or leveraging the power of machines so that you can do more with less effort. And so there's, a, there's this thing called the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle, which some of you may have heard of. Pareto was an economist in, um, in Italy, I think in the Middle Ages or late Middle Ages. And um, he, he focused on how sometimes you can put a little effort in and get maximum results. So you, you could, for example, put in 20% of effort but get 80% of the returns that you would normally get if you put in 100%. So the idea is, you know, at some point, it's you want to not put in extra effort. You want to work smarter, not harder, basically, is, is the message here. So this means really for lawyers that you kind of have to abandon this tendency, which we all tend to have, 
of seeking perfection, right? We live in a world where everything we do is questioned and it's all high stakes. And so we tend to obsess and try to achieve perfe perfection. Um, and then sometimes not take action until we know how we're going to get that perfection. Well, the 80-20 rule says let's stop trying to do that because you're never going to achieve perfection. And that extra effort that you put in a lot of the times isn't worth it. So what you're, do what you're trying to do is get big gains that come from you know, even minimal effort. Now, automation can definitely provide this, but this goes deeper than just using software or virtual assistants, right? It's, it's a way of looking at what's going on and creating a strategy and creating systems because systems aren't necessarily something that, you know, a computer does. Uh, it's something that you apply to the work you do, and some of that work involves computers. But it's about being systematic in a really smart way. And I know, Craig, you've looked at this. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to say about the 80-20 rule, but I know we've talked about this and how important it is. Well, I think that you, when you realize, when you find something that makes you so much more efficient, um, whether it's it's the way that you schedule appointments or anything, I mean, you just can't imagine living the other way. Um, and again, it's it's not it's not super easy. There's some trial and error here, but you have to basically take everything that you do from a systematic approach and, and kind of say, okay, does this work really to get this job done? You know, what can I do? Uh, I'm just going to give you this example right here. And it, this sounds really um, simple, but it's changed my life, really, in, in the practice to make me a, a better consultant, is I've put a link in my email that allows clients to schedule appointments for me. So I no longer have to do the back and forth where my assistant then calls their assistant, and then we try to look at you know two separate calendar bases. Um, I just gave a link so clients can click on the link and schedule an appointment. They can look at their calendar, and they're looking at mine. They can schedule an appointment. Um, I mean, that has that that one thing right there is is one of the, the best things I've done, and it's so simple and it's so easy, and and you know clients love it. So it's just finding stuff like that. Um, that really can make a big difference. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I first came across this concept reading Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, which is a really great book. It's it it's it can be all over the place for a lot of things, but it's really great for automation and and definitely explains the eighty twenty rule. And then also Perry Marshall's book Eighty Twenty Sales and Marketing, which is talks about it in the context of marketing. All right, so that's the that's how you become efficient. That's how you kind of the mindset and the approach. Let's talk about pre launch. So when we talk about pre-launch, pre we're going to be talking about things like dealing with uh, existing clients. If you're in a firm or you know, if you're not in a firm, getting new clients, that comes under the rubric of marketing. Um, we talk about back office software, the kinds of things that lawyers need or think that they need. In some cases, they don't really need. You know, so the question is, what do you really need and why? We're going to talk about equipment. We're going to drill into what kinds of computers you would buy um, and so forth and what you know what are the best options there. So let's get started with marketing and clients. So the first thing of course the lawyers know that they need to do is if they're in a firm they need, they know that they need to talk uh, to the, lot, the clients that they're planning on taking and saying look I'm leaving um, here's the deal and you have to consult you know the ethics rules and so forth and work with your existing firm and hopefully they're cool with that um, if you're starting out from scratch, you don't have this problem, so that's pretty easy. But you are going to need clients, and so you need to think about that. So one of the things you want to be thinking about is what kind of clients do you want? So just because you had certain kinds of clients in the other firm, or just because you thought you wanted to practice a certain kind of way coming out of law school, you really need to think about what kind of work do you really, really like doing, and try to get more of that kind of work and not just more of a lot of kind of work because it, you'll be happier, your clients will be happier, the profession will be better off if you're really happy serving the kinds of people that you really like and that can get to really know, like, and trust you. So marketing requires drilling into what sort of focus are you going to have, what's your, you know, to use buzzwords, target audience, your niche, um, you know, the people that you really want to focus on. You have to think about that. And you shouldn't do this reflexively. Now, it may be if you're starting out of law school, you you know don't know what kind of clients you want to work with, you don't have experience, fine. But if you've been in practice for a while, you should kind of have a sense of what sorts of clients you like working with and what kinds of legal problems you like solving. And a good marketing approach 
which we'll talk more about, um, will let you get those kinds of clients. Okay, so you should think about that. And then you need to plan for how you're going to um, make yourself available and known and establish your reputation. Um, a lot of that happens, you know, word of mouth, face to face, you know, networking and so forth. But a lot of it happens these days online. So you're going to need a website. You're going to need an email service to be able to send out um, email newsletters and email notifications. Um, but first of all, you need a domain name. So you need to br brainstorm what's your domain name going to be. So in my case, it was, you know, svensonlaw.com. And I went and rented that domain name at hover.com. But if you're not sure what kind of domain name you want to have, you don't want to use your last name, you want to come up with something clever, you can go to wordoid.com, brainstorm there, and then go to hover.com and uh, get the domains there or go to GoDaddy if you prefer GoDaddy. So that's the overview of marketing. Now let's turn to what kind of software you're going to need um, to run your back office. And here's where I think Craig really can give you the best advice. Yeah, and uh, just, just one thing to add. It's really what I've noticed law firms, when they're picking out their names, they're going by what domain name they could get, uh, which is important. So that really does drive the decision to make sure if you want to be you know, the Smith Law Firm, you know you're never going to get that domain name. So see what's available, and that will help that decision. Um, yeah, so, so going into back office software, um, you know, there's a lot of, of I, I wouldn't say there's, there's a lot of confusion in the space when you're starting out of what type of software do you really need to get. And so I'm trying not to use, you know, you know people have all sorts of defini definitions of what is practice management software, but let's talk about what you need starting off you have to be able to do a couple of things. If you're doing any sort of fixed fee or hourly billing, you have to be able to track information and easily create a bill and send it out to a client. And if you're contingency based, you have to be able to still track expenses and be able to create a settlement statement and give it to a client. You also have to be able to create a tax return and work with the CPA. If you can't do these things, you'll just go out of business. So this is the most important thing. This is what you should be looking for first. Could this be part of a practice management software? It could be. But again, you want to make a list of, you know, are you an insurance defense firm that needs to be able to do leads billing? Or are you a personal injury attorney that needs to be able to track all these costs and be able to easily create a settlement statement. You know, this is the sort of stuff that you should make a list of what you need to do and then make sure that it can be accomplished. And, and the other stuff that practice, you know, case management, that stuff is all nice and it works really, really well. And, you know, we're not against it at all, but the first thing that you have to be concerned with is am I going to be able to get money into my firm and am I going to be able to analyze where that money's coming from? And that really is you know, billing and accounting. Yeah, and you know, so I went through this um, this tormentous decision process when I was leaving the big firm. And what's funny is, you know, I had access to all these people who knew the answers supposedly. Uh, but and when I say supposedly, it's not because they don't know the answers. It's because this is really a it depends on what you're doing kind of thing as. Craig talked about. And so in my case, I wasn't really sure what kind of practice I wanted to, have, wanted to have. And I knew that if I made a decision to go with some particular practice management software, or if I went with some billing software, that I probably would never change. Um, I looked at my big firm, which they had bought into some accounting package that was the biggest, greatest, you know, most amazing thing that was probably too much for what they, um, for the size of their firm. And as I learned more and more about it, I realized, you know, they, they could have saved money and they would have been better off with a smaller system that was more suited to what they did. But having made that decision, the one thing they were never going to do was, was go offline for a couple of days while they converted over everything to a different system. So, you know, that some things people will convert, but, you know, this is not one of those things you're going to convert. So I, I was very wary about this and I didn't want to commit and I kind of steer, you know, stayed away from doing it. I'm glad I did because, at, you know, as time went on, the cloud 
became more dominant and the, the thing I would have chosen would have been server-based, would have been on a computer and then migrating that off of there to the cloud would have been more tricky. So, you know, I, I did use practice management software that was cloud-based eventually, but it took me a long time to really settle on what which one I would pick. Um, and the same was true for billing and accounting. I was wary about using um, that, that kind of software. I used non-law specific software, which worked okay for a while, but then the problem was it didn't have trust accounting. And I know that's that's a big deal, right, Craig? Right. And I mean, again, so I mean, really, here here's the advice that we're giving you is you need to sit down with a sheet of paper and make a list of what you need. There are some attorneys that never use a trust account. So in that case, it's, it's not important. Um, but that's the thing with the law is, you know, again, a, you know, personal injury is so much different than family law. You know, it's completely different with different needs. So sit there and make a list of, I have to be able to do these five or six things. And then you can start looking at software and making sure that they, uh, that they achieve those goals. Um, the, the one thing I'll add in here is we're pretty big on the cloud, probably because we're in South Louisiana and we've had to deal with various hurricanes and we see the advantages that we've had over our competitors. Um, but looking at, at at all these things, I'm just going to give you maybe a general rule of thumb. Uh, practice management, document management, email and stuff like that, that is, there's so many good cloud options there. Um, back office software, so your accounting and billing package has for whatever reason kind of lagged, so you might actually be buying software that you install on your computer and you have to maintain, um, and that is, but you need that functionality, and that functionality might not exist in the cloud, okay? So that's okay because you can still run most of that stuff from any laptop or desktop computer. Um, so we're going to kind of say, you know, look at cloud-based as much as possible and realize it's going to be okay if you try, you decide to buy some billing and accounting software and install it on your computer. That's okay because you need it to be able to manage your trust account, you know. So um, that's what I'd add there. Um, document management um, and email hosting. So cloud-based or server-based. You know what it really comes down to? Um, it, it also, you know, what are you comfortable with? And I would also say, how much, how many, how much documents do you have? What do you ha Are you moving? Are you leaving a firm, and you're going to have 50 gigabytes of data? Um, that's a, that is a lot of data to store in the cloud. Um, however, I'm going to look at it, I, whatever solution you want. You want to be able to pull up a document on any device at any time. So, so that should be on your checklist right there. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'll just say that I, I would lean to all this being cloud-based. Oh, the email hosting, that's a no-brainer. That is a no-brainer um, unless you're a thousand-person firm. It's a no and even then it's still a no-brainer, but you want to have your email hosted. And what we mean by that is you don't want to have a server in your office where your email is actually running off of. So you want to use something like Microsoft 365 or, or, or Google Apps. Well, we can talk about that so, and some more in a little bit. Um, Document management-wise, where do your documents reside? Probably, at the at the least, need to have some sort of cloud-based backup, but maybe should all be in the cloud. Um, and that's maybe what I would lean to, for the for the reasons of mobility, for the disaster recovery, um, for viruses like BitLocker. That if you had all your documents sitting on a, a server at your office, they could all be encrypted by hacker, which has happened to a lot of law firms and a lot of small law firms. Um, so there just seems to be a real good compelling argument to move all that stuff into the cloud. Yeah, I mean, I think these days you, you need a really good reason to continue to use servers or to buy a server in the first place. And I'm not saying that there aren't good reasons. You gave one example, but, you know, the, the well, mindset well, should be toward, like, the cloud wherever possible unless there's something you need to do that involves owning a server. But, but let me and let me let's be clear on this because this is where there is a lot of misinformation and I feel that some people when they're starting out they blow money on this huge server that they don't need. Um, let's say that you decide that you need uh, an accounting software because it does the trust accounting and it does the leads billing and you have to run that at your office. Okay, 
that that does not mean that you need to go out and buy a ten thousand dollar server. Okay, we're, you know we're not saying that, and I think people fall into that trap when they're starting out. You could buy a six hundred dollar desktop and run that off of it. You know the technology has advanced so much that when you're buying a, a desktop computer now, it was a server five years ago, or it's more powerful than a server five years ago. So even if you have to run some on-premise stuff, we might be able, when you're starting off at least, to run that off off the desktops. And maybe uh, you know in a year or two when you grow, you add more people, you might have to buy a more robust machine. But the days of buying you know these five thousand dollar servers when you're just starting off through a small firm, those, that's over. It doesn't happen anymore. Right. And you can. We both have a friend, a, a young lawyer, who he he runs Macs, and so he needs to do some things that have to happen on Windows computers, and he basically just rents um, space in the cloud so he can run Microsoft applications because he doesn't want to even own a physical computer to keep to to keep. Um, Keep track of it, and that's another option. So that, you know, there's all kinds of options here. Um, in general, you know, you want to think about the cloud. You want to pay attention to all the different applications that you need to use. As Craig said, make a list. Uh, another factor is if you're a solo, you can get away with some things that you wouldn't be able to get away with if you're in a group of other people because you have to collaborate. So all those are factors. Um, you know, I would say talk to a consultant and get help and make sure that you have a clear idea of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, but basically, me, Craig and I are in complete agreement, I think, on, on all these things. Let me, let me just add one, one thing here. Um, this is the, I don't really want to get involved in some sort of, you know, can you use cloud computing? You can you, you know, we're saying go with cloud computing, but just think about this, because we're saying here, you know, your do document management, cloud-based. Um, if you are a personal injury attorney, and you're dealing with a lot of med medical records, you need to make sure that whatever you're using is HIPAA compliant. Those are the kind of things that you just need to check. Again, this is making a list. So am I dealing with medical records? Yes. So I need, if I'm going with the cloud-based, it has to be HIPAA compliant. Make sure that you kind of address those issues. Right. All right. So uh, the last thing on this list is PDF software. So if you're going to be able to access your information from anywhere, anytime, which is what modern law firms do. You're going to need to take some of that paper, as much of it as possible, not overnight, but you're going to want to convert it into something, and that something would be a PDF file. Um, lawyers are increasingly familiar with PDFs because federal courts now require all pleadings to be filed in PDF format. Um, PDFs come up in digital discovery a lot of times. So we're familiar with PDFs. The problem with lawyers is we tend to just say, yeah, I can open a PDF and read it, but we don't know how to manipulate the PDFs and do things like insert pages or rotate pages that have been misrotated or bait stamp them or redact them or search across a batch of PDFs. There's a whole bunch of things that you can do with PDFs if you, uh, A, are familiar with the options and B, know how to do it. So you can do a lot with the free Adobe Reader program, but lawyers should get Adobe Acrobat or its equivalent, which would be Nuance Power PDF. Um, Acrobat comes in two versions if you're in the Windows world. Um, it comes in professional or standard. If you're in the Mac world, you can only get the professional. The professional costs $420 roughly. You can go to Amazon and see. Uh, it's now a subscription model as well, which costs about 12 or Fourteen dollars a month, um, so you can do it either way. But you know that's a lot of money. And then the standard version, which you can get if you're a Windows user, costs three hundred dollars. The standard version does not bait stamp or redact, but you know so it's probably good enough for most people. But you're going to be spending three hundred dollars at least for Adobe Acrobat. Nuance Power PDF is like one hundred and twenty or one hundred and forty dollars. It does everything that Acrobat does. It actually has a nicer interface. So if you're starting from scratch, I would say Nuance Power PDF would probably be the software you want to go with. Um, and you know, I've written a couple of books about how to use Adobe Acrobat or Adobe Reader. I have not yet written a book about Nuance Power PDF, but you know, either one of those books kind of tells you what the options are that you can um, you can do um, and, and helps you learn about it. So I would say the modern lawyer and modern law firm needs to know how to manipulate PDFs and do stuff with them. Agree, Craig? Absolutely. Any Nuance Power PDF, do you need a subscription or can you just buy it? 
it don't, I don't think they sell it in subscription. You just buy it outright, okay. which I think is actually preferable. So it, it, it is. I mean, I think a lot of people are still going on eBay to try to buy Adobe Acrobat because they don't want to buy the subscription right now. So I, I mean, I've known a lot of law firms that have been doing that. Right. And Adobe. One of the things Adobe is doing, which a lot of companies are doing now, is they've got this new offering called Adobe DC Direct Cloud or Document Cloud or something in the cloud. And what they're trying to get you to do is store all your PDFs in their document repository because it makes your life easier and you can open them on an iPad or mobile phone or whatever. And, you know, that's all fine and well, except the problem is every one of these people thinks you're going to be storing the documents related to their stuff on their system, which is insane because then you don't have a centralized document management system. So that's why I kind of am steering people away from Adobe Acrobat is I think that they're trying a little too hard to lock you in um, and with a subscription model in this new DC thing. So if you don't have Adobe Acrobat, I would get Nuance Power PDF. All right, let's talk about equipment. New computer. Um, you know, I think if your old computer is three years old, you need to start thinking about getting a new one. Um, you might be able to get by for a while. Um, we can kind of drill into the specs, but I mean, we have a list that we'd be happy to send you, but if you want to kind of quickly hit the high points on this, Craig, um, I know that some people will get acronym fever if we blast them with too much <laughs> stuff. Yeah, I mean, so we'll start off here. Uh, Windows or Mac, you know, really not that much of an issue. They both do the same job, so if you're comfortable with one or the other, um, pick that where you're comfortable with it. You, you don't, if you don't have a compelling reason to move, I wouldn't move. The other thing is, is you're thinking of making a list of everything you need. Make sure it's compatible on one or the other. And then just real quick, not to get super geeky, you want something with eight, eight gigabytes of RAM, you know, that or more. I mean, that's really the, the big thing there. Um, and then the new Mac OS or Windows 10, um, try not to get Windows 8. I guess that's probably the, the recommendation I would make. Yeah, and we'll you know we'll tell you at the end how to get uh, how to get all this stuff, the list and everything, so you don't have to remember it all. Um, again, lap, laptop though. Laptop. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. And again, you're not you're not going to have a desktop at your house, uh, a desktop at your office, and then a laptop you travel with. Just have one computer. Yeah. And then you know your phone. You have a smartphone. Uh, Craig mentioned you know bring your own device. Use as many of your devices that you already own. Uh, but you are going to probably need some kind of actual traditional phone, although I wouldn't get a traditional phone service from traditional providers. Rather, I would get what's called a VoIP-based service. VoIP stands for Voice Over IP, meaning it's a device you plug into an internet um, connection, and you can take it anywhere if you need to, and it works at a much lower cost, has more options. Phone Engine Pocket 8 are two of the ones you could you could use you can also use Skype actually and even Ring Central and then um, having your phone service I would also consider getting a receptionist service the best one out there by far and you know is Ruby receptionist and Craig you turned me on to them so I let you tell folks about how great they are but they they made my life a lot easier yeah and and really let's just talk about it this this way you're starting off a new firm um, you might not have the money to hire a receptionist However, I really, you know, uh, attorney, that's a, that's a really high-end professional service business, and you, I really just, you don't want when someone calls your office, you know, if you want to see, hear the directory, hit eight. If you want to do this, hit nine. You want a live person to answer the phone. I think that's one way of, of differentiating yourself from the competition, but you might not want to pay someone $40, you know, 40 hours, you know, a week to do that this is where we're getting a virtual receptionist. So if you call my office at any time between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., a live human being is going to answer the phone, and they know, like right now I'm out of the office, so they know to just send all my calls to my cell phone. I mean, they, you know, you have the ability to program this sort of stuff in. You have the ability if, oh, if this is a new uh, case, have them talk to this person. I mean, you, you could do stuff like that. So Ruby Receptionist is one option. Um, it's the one that I use, so I can highly recommend it. And I would say that sometimes I look at that cost, I'm saying, oh, it's kind of expensive. But the reality is it's cheaper than hiring someone for minimum wage. 
and you know they're never sick. They've got a, and they're it's all done in the U.S. Um, and really, it, it is one of the easiest decisions I've made. And I yeah, think and even firm, even firms that have gotten bigger to like you know 10, 20, 30 users, they still use something like Ruby. Yeah, and and you when you you told me about it, Craig, and then I tried it. I said I'm gonna try it for 21 days, the free trial period, and I was sure I was gonna cancel it because I thought at the time it was expensive. But I realized some things in using it, like for example, it's not a good idea for the attorney to be answering their own phone. That's one problem. Number two, you can send it to voicemail or something like Ring Central, but that's voicemail, and that's not gonna you know make people feel warm and and cozy. And then I had examples of sometimes, you know, one time a client called and they were mad about something and Ruby calls and they're always cheerful and they said, by the way, you know, this client seems kind of mad, which is a nice thing to know. But, you know, I wouldn't know that if I was answering my own phone. It's kind of good to get prepared. Hmm, I wonder what they're mad about. Or a judge is calling and then they know, oh, a judge, you need to be, that person needs to be put through. So you can try to automate that stuff with Ring Central, which I tried for, you know, for months. Or you can make your life easier and, and present a much more professional appearance, which these days in the world of you know phone maze for any big company, when somebody can call your office and get a live human being who makes them feel good, um, that's that's worth paying for. So Ruby Reception is pretty amazing. I would check it out. Uh, printers, you know, I wouldn't spend a lot of money on a printer. You got FedEx out there for big print jobs, but you definitely need some kind of printer. So you know, I have a hundred dollar black and white laser printer made by brother and I also got a color printer. I think Craig you recommended the color printer to me. I forget what we paid for it, but it's like two hundred dollars. Also a brother Something printer. Like that. Yeah. So we can give you the specs on those, but you don't need a lot of printing capability because you can use FedEx. You do need a scanner because we're gonna be paperless, remember? And if you're gonna get a scanner, there's only one to get, right Craig? Absolutely. No Could brainer. Just, there's if, yeah. The, just, the IX five hundred is um is the best scanner. Everyone that we we don't make any money by recommending this, but no. everyone that we recommend it to has come back and said this is a great scanner. And yeah. th I want to say this: the best thing about the Fujitsu ScanSnap is it integrates with basically every single legal package out there. So whatever practice management or billing and accounting software you decide to choose, I bet you it has the ScanSnap integration. Yep. All right, so let's talk about launching. You've got all the information. You've figured out what you need. You've brainstormed. So what do you need on day one? Well, number one, you need a website. Um, and you know, do not put up a website that says coming soon or, you know, this will come happen. It's very easy to get a, a website up that looks good. It's not hard. It's not expensive. We're going to tell you how to do it um, easily and, and inexpensively. You need to have some sort of email service that's associated with the domain that you picked out when you brainstormed earlier so that you can receive email professionally and not just use you know your Hotmail account or your at Gmail or anything like that. You need a professional email um, address and so that you've already got because you picked out the domain. You just need to host it, which we'll talk about in a second. And you need some sort of branding for things like business cards. You know, Maybe you need a logo for your letterhead and stuff like that. That's a lot of fun. People like figuring that out. So that's the kind of thing you're going to need on day one. So let's talk about the website. So the website these days, um, you know, it used to be there were a lot of options. Nowadays, I would say it's very clear what you should do. You should get a WordPress site. So you're going to go use WordPress software, which is free, but you're going to want to pay for a theme. And you want the theme, and there's millions of themes out there. Um, and some of them look great, some of them look bad, you know, but don't make, you don't want to be overwhelmed here. So you want here's what you need. You need for it to be mobile responsive, meaning it adapts itself dynamically to show well on a phone or an iPad or any size screen. And you want it to be HTML5 responsive and some other things that you probably don't care about. The easiest way to do this is is go to studiopress.com and look at the choices there because every single one of those is mobile responsive, HTML5 ready, and so forth. And both Craig and I have websites. I've had a bunch of them. They're all on Studio Press themes now. Um, all of those themes are powered by the Genesis framework, which again, you don't care about, but you're going to need to get that too. Total cost of that is like about 100 bucks, right? Um, the domain that you're going to need once you've brainstormed this over at Hover or GoDaddy, um, I recommend Hover just because they're easier to deal with on the phone if you have questions and you're like more likely to have questions. 
than me or Craig, and I still like Hover a lot more than GoDaddy. Um, it costs about $15 at Hover. It might be 5 at GoDaddy, but trust me, the extra $10 a year is worth it. Um, and, and Hover will help you figure out how to connect this up You know, if you want to try to do it yourself. You're also going to need a place to host the website. So you have the domain, which directs people to where the website is, and you have the software. But where is this, where is this website? It's wherever it's being hosted, and you can host it in a lot of different places, and you can drive yourself nuts trying to find a bunch of different ones. But basically what you want is one that works well with WordPress. WordPress recommends a couple of different ones, um, and WordPress is, a, is an organization. It's kind of like a do-gooder organization. They don't really make a lot of money in, in the ways that most companies try to make money. So they're really kind of more here for the public good which I know sounds weird, but it's true. So Bluehost is one they recommend. I've used Bluehost. It's really cheap. It's $60 a year. You can start there. Um, but if you're really planning on using your website to market and you really want to make sure that it's not just up all the time and running, but also very responsive and not taking a long time for the pages to load, because you know, especially on a mobile device, people will give up um, if, you're, if your site takes too long to load, and Google will also penalize you for that. Um, you want something like WP Engine, which costs thirty dollars a month, or Web Synthesis, made by the same folks who do Studio Press. That one costs forty-seven dollars a month. And if you're serious about, you know, getting clients and so forth, I would recommend good hosting. I would not waste time on design. You can get that done later. The design is accomplished when you pick the theme that you like. Later on, you can circle back to design. But this is an area where people stall out because they spend too much money with a designer who won't tell them that none of that stuff really matters. Um, so trust me, it doesn't matter. Just don't waste money on that. Right. Especially, yeah. just real quick, yeah, when you're yeah. starting out, you, you have a finite budget. So we just want to get something up there that looks really good. And so that is, um, you know, again, you might do a refresh of the website three years into business when you've got a better um, idea of what you're doing, and maybe you'll hire someone then to do it. But this is just the, the nuts and bolts to get you off the ground. Yeah, for sure. And email. So we talked about web-based email. I use Google Apps for business. Um, I don't use Microsoft as much just because I'm Mac-based. If I was a heavy Mac user, I would look more to Microsoft. But my main message, and I'll, let, I'll turn it over to Craig because he knows more about this than I do. My main message is, you know, you want web-based email because, you know, who's better at keeping servers up and running? You, me, anybody we know, Fortune 500 company IT people, or geniuses who graduated from Stanford who go to work for Google and Microsoft? Answer, geniuses who go to work for Google and Microsoft, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we're just going to make this real easy for you. You're either going to get Google Apps or Microsoft 365. About $5 an email address a month, and they do basically the same thing. Uh, the way that you're going to make that decision is based on what sort of software you get. Um, some practice management software directly integrates with Google Apps, and some of it directly integrates with Microsoft 365. So that really helps drive the decision. And um, just to let you know, you can run Microsoft 365 on a Mac or a Windows computer. You can run Google Apps on a Mac or a Windows computer. So I think this really comes down to what sort of practice management software you pick to see what they integrate with, and that will help drive the decision. Um, the other thing I would add is if you like Gmail, go with Google Apps. If you like Outlook, go with Microsoft 365. Yep. And then you're going to have to hook that um, domain that you have to, um, to wherever, you're, wherever you're hosting your, your, you know, your email with either Google or Microsoft. You can try to do it yourself, or I would just go to Upwork.com, which used to be called um, O-Work, I mean, um, Odesk. And Elance, those those were two different virtual assistant outsourced companies. They merged and became they became Upwork. And so Upwork.com is where you go and you hire freelancers on an as-needed basis. Um, and that's probably the cheapest, best place to get that work done, as well as have them set up your website um, and so forth. So I got my websites set up and email, you know, like for 200 bucks. Um, I know you did the same thing, Craig. You've used Upwork as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so it's just really easy just to get that, that basic website out that looks professional enough that, that'll do the job. Yep. Uh, and then mail service. So this is something that a lot of people overlook. Um, they, they figure, okay, well, I got my, my 
domain, you know, at Svenson Law or whatever your firm's name is, and I can send emails out there. And so if I'm, you know, going to send emails to my client, I'll send it from there. And you know, you are going to be sending it from that address. But the problem is, if you send too many emails at one time to a group of people from your your business email address, the internet service providers out there immediately look at you and think, is this person a spammer? And they have algorithms to figure out whether you might be a spammer or not. Google won't even let you send emails to more than 100 people or you know, 100 people at a time. So, um, and you don't want to be sending emails where everybody can see who all you're sending all the emails to. That's not professional. So if you're going to have a, a way of messaging your clients uh, or your prospective clients, you need a professional email service, and they're really not that expensive. I mean, MailChimp is free for up to 2,000 names. AWeber is professional. That's probably the best professional one that you pay for. And that one's $19 a month. And I use Infusionsoft. You probably don't need to. That's $199 a month. But, but what these services do is they allow you to send through that company's server. So that company is kind of acting as an agent and making sure that before they release your emails out into the wild, that you're reputable. So the fact that it's coming out of their servers makes it more likely to go through and will cause you less problems. If you try to do it yourself, you will probably get into trouble with Google, and then that ultimately might even affect your main email account. Um, but if you're going to have a website, you should collect people's email addresses. You should certainly collect your clients' email addresses. And, um, and there's a lot to be said about the marketing and how you collect prospective clients' email addresses, which we're not going to be able to get into. But you know, there's no reason not to get MailChimp. It's free. So I would just go get MailChimp. Yeah, just to add one thing to that, you might have right now no intention to send out any sort of newsletter, and that's fine, but that probably is going to change someday. And so if you just set this up now when MailChimp's free and start collecting it, two years down the line when you start doing it and you realize the benefit, you've already got a, a, a mailing list. Yep, exactly. All right, so last thing is branding, which is the fun thing. Everybody likes to have their business cards and logo and letterhead and so forth. And a lot of different ways to do this. You can get you can get them cheap and fast on a site called Fiverr.com. That's five with two R's, .com afterwards. Or you can spend more money, go on Upwork and hire a designer. Um, those are some options for getting business cards. Um, you shouldn't spend a lot of money on business cards. There's sites called Moo.com and Vistaprint, which you've probably seen advertisements for on TV, those will all, you know, take the artwork that's uploaded by your designer and send you business cards on an as-needed basis. Really easy to use. That's what I would recommend. As for your letterhead, I would recommend you get a copy of a lawyer named uh, Matthew Butterick, who uh, wrote a book called Typography for Lawyers. He was a graphic designer before he went to law school, and he looked at all of the things lawyers did that were wrong in terms of typography, and then he wrote this book that basically explains to you exactly how to fix the common typography mistakes that cause the pleadings, letterhead, and so forth that lawyers create not to look like it was done by a professional typographer. So if you buy the book, it'll tell you exactly how to do it, um, or you can hire folks on Fiverr.com who probably will not have read this book, uh, or Upwork.com you know, who won't have read the book but understand design, that's the way you would get your letterhead, but you don't want to get letterhead that's pre-printed and that you feed into your computer because that's not efficient and that's not streamlined and that's not automated. And then the last thing is I would say if you, for any kind of design, if you're willing to spend a little bit more money, if you go to 99designs.com, you can get seven-day turnaround. So you can say, I, you know, today I know I want to start getting um, you know, design for a business card, let's say. In seven days, you will have the design done because what they do is they crowdsource it, meaning they put it out for everybody to, um, to, to compete for your design, and so you get to see designs submitted by other people, and you get to you know, get better ideas about what kind of design you would want to use and so forth. So it's about 300 bucks for logos, business cards, and letterheads, but I would at least check it out. So that, all that stuff we talked about, is the way that you create a modern law firm, right? And there's a lot more to be said about that, um, but those are kind of the main points. And I would say if you want to learn any more about this, and I know some folks do, then if you go to smallfirmbootcamp.com, click on free guides, and then click on starting a new firm, you will be able to get for free 
um, a document, a PDF that has all, you know, pretty much all this information that Craig and I have been talking about today with links, you know, uh, what kind of computer you should get, all that stuff, you know, packed into one PDF so you don't have to go rooting around for it. So that's it. Um, and with that, I would say thank you all very much for listening.